Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark. I am, of course, your host, Daniel Rhodes, and my guest today is Caitlin Salkin. Caitlin, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, my name is Caitlin. I graduated from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in 2021 with a dual double degree in both archaeology and also classics. So that's what led me here to this podcast today. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what we are talking about today. So after about two years of lots of research and lots of writing and work, I am finally releasing a book called Dig It Archaeology for Kids. Here it is. I am so excited. Um, it's out officially um, April, Tuesday, April 25th. You can get your copy anywhere online that sells books like Barnes and Noble and Amazon and also our website Persnickety Press. Um, I am really excited to share what I have researched and learned and know about archaeology with a younger generation. Yeah, and that's something a lot of people ask us as archaeologists is how do they get their kids involved? And that's the reason I wanted Caitlin to be here is because stuff like this is a really great example of how you and your children can connect over the field of archaeology is books like this. Thank you. Yeah, I think this book is a great opportunity for not only the kids to learn a lot, but also the parents who are learning along with the kids because even if they know a good amount about archaeology, um, I assume a lot of the listeners right now are in that boat, there are still a lot of different discoveries or archaeological sites in this book that are super well known, but also those that are not as well known and not really talked about as much. And it's a very worldly book. We touch on all the continents except obviously Antarctica. That one hard to come by <laughs> you can't really yeah, no no one wants to go archaeology ing in antarctica that uh, that's a word you can teach your kids archaeology ing because it's a verb now <laughs> <laughs> yeah i wouldn't want to go archaeology in antarctica but yeah so there's a lot of, to learn for everyone and there are also activities in the back of the book um that you could do with your kids and lots of other resources um for instance, there is one where you practice using a shaker screen to shake rice away from cereal and the cereal is your artifacts. So there's a bunch of different activities that you can, with specific instructions you can do in your home setting or um, out in the world. There, There's a whole section on archeology span talks and classes, events, summer camps, um, also, and a bunch of QR codes to those. Um, QR codes is something that I really utilize in this book, um, as not only for the activities, but as you're going through, the, any reader can take out their smartphone and scan the QR codes throughout the book, and they will be greeted with a little short clip of either a site that we're talking about, like a flyover view, or a demonstration of a digging technique in the field. So it's really immersive and gets every everyone involved that way. That is something that I think is extremely cool, especially the digging technique, because whenever we do a public program with children, that's really anyone who does a program with children, the digging techniques are really something that you want to drill into them but you don't want to like harp on it too, because it'll make them crazy just with the scraping continuous. Yeah, I, I was trying to find, there are certain parts of this book that could have been really dry to write, especially the digging, some, some of the parts in the digging process or some of the parts in the lab. So we try to incorporate the fun parts of those and create um, excitement around those. For instance, in the book, commonly when we talk about stratigraphy and try to make sense of it attribute it to like a layer cake and so that's like what we do in the book on one one section 
Yeah, so you teach them archaeology with cake. I can see why I feel like more people should adopt this, just teaching archaeology with cake, especially in the college level. Oh, yeah, I would have eaten that right up. (laughs) So what led you to writing this? So I've been writing most of my life um, through columns or short stories, things like that. And I have also tried to find different ways of my creative outlet, such as music or dance or different ways to express myself creatively. And getting out of college, I was still wanting to learn and research. And so I combined that love for writing, wanting to find a creative outlet, and also continue to learn and research archaeology all in one to create this book. I think one of the biggest inspirations for this book, though, was I didn't know much at all about archaeology. I'd always been fascinated with ancient things, museums, um, history throughout my whole life, but I never really got exposed to the intricacies of archaeology itself until I got to college, my first semester of college. I was an undecided major. I took a class on Egyptian archaeology because as a kid, I loved Cleopatra, and I just fell in love with archaeology from there. So I figured if kids can learn about it a lot earlier and some of the intricacies and how exciting and fascinating it could be, um, because I missed out on that opportunity younger, I could have done a lot of things when I was younger around archaeology. So I want to give people, kids, that opportunity to learn and have more time to build their love for archaeology. Yeah, that's something a lot of organizations, I think, are, especially since COVID has ended, they're taking a second look at the way they teach archaeology to children or creating more opportunities to teach archaeology to children. If nothing else, just to have more hands on public programs. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think this would be a great resource. And I, I'm really hoping that it reaches a wider audience so that kids can become aware and fall in love and have this in, insightful moment where they're like, I can become an archaeologist. There's a whole section in the book where it gives an example of some a kid who found something um, in archaeology and then also an adult who grew up to do archaeology and how kids can get involved with archaeology at a younger age, the different jobs that are in the future if they are looking for a career path and just the trajectory. And this is towards the end of the book after they've already learned about all these exciting sites and a little bit about the world of archaeology. So when you were writing this, did you have a hard time translating the language from like, say, how you learned it in a college level to like an elementary school age child? (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Um, The glossary is extensive in this book. Um, There are so many vocabulary words that I had to define. It was, um, there's a whole section on the side. I'll see if I can find an example. For instance, On the side here, there is a vocabulary word section. Um, You'll see orange strips with vocabulary word sections and to define a bunch of words. And there's words that you have to define for the certain sites, such as the cultures there. um, So you understand what culture we're talking about, Um, but also regular words that kids would need to know about archeology. span Just like, for instance, as we talked about earlier, stratigraphy, how do you define that? Um, There's a bunch of different words and how to break it down in a way that kids understand it and the layman understands it was extremely difficult. Um, But obviously, it's good to do that as a thought experiment, but also helpful because you avoid plagiarism obviously. <laughs> yeah, being in academic jail is not fun, people. I have never personally been, but I would assume it's terrible. Yeah, they lock you up with that key. 
yeah, mm-hmm. they just throw it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something I think a lot of people, especially when they work with kids, is they um, second guess themselves on how they explain it. I know I do this constantly is when I'm teaching something to like an elementary school age child. Are they understanding the language that I'm using, like the law of superposition? I'm having to use smaller words to explain it. And I'm like, oh, my God, am I teaching this correctly? Is this how I learned this? Right, right. Um, This book was originally going to be for a younger audience, but then it kept building and building because there was more things I wanted to talk about in the book. So it ended up being 100 pages of jam-packed information. And we said, no, this is more for 10 to 16 range versus younger kid audience for sure. So let me ask you this. I've seen uh, you flip through some of the pages. Did you do the artwork and stuff yourself? Um, We have a graphic designer or like a design team um, at Persnickety Press who did a lot of the work on that. But I was it was very collaborative for me. I would look over their design choices and their edits and give my own input. And I did do a good amount of the design. I learned a lot about how to use the InDesign program on the computer. Um, All the photos within the book, I hand selected, um, had to go through the permissions process. That was not something I was expecting going into this whole process. I was expecting all the research and the writing, but the photos and photo permissions, um, that wasn't something that I was really expecting to deal with. But yeah, every photo you see in the book is specifically hand selected to try to illustrate the points in the best way possible um, and try to do high quality images and a lot of images because obviously there's a lot of text to accompany it and it does we try not to make it too overwhelming on the text to have those fun images and throughout the book there are certain pages with just spreads of some of the sites that we're talking about for instance when we talk about Pompeii casts, we have a whole page that's blown up with images of just like the really cool casts that you get. Now, it sounds like there are a lot of different sites in the book. Do you have a favorite site of all the ones that are in the book? You're making me choose between my children. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I well, asked the hard questions here. <laughs> Okay, so there's a bunch of different sites, but also examples of discoveries. My favorite thing in the book that we wrote about in the climate section, preservation section, is a thing called bog butter. Um, yeah, I, I know that. <laughs> I know about bog butter. I, I just, it's so fun to say bog butter. So yeah, like how the normal butter usually like would decompose and but like this bog butter that's found the fatty food like dairy is preserved in a bog in Ireland and Scotland and one of the theories that archaeologists have we talk a lot about interpretation in this book and theories and how things aren't facts but possible explanations of the past um so one of those here is that that's how they kept food fresh before refrigerators because back in the day we don't got those handy dandy refrigerators that we have now yeah, seeing or having to explain bog butter to a child is one thing I enjoy about doing American archaeology. It's not something I have to think about. <laughs> yeah, but that's probably my favorite thing I talk about in the book because when I I didn't know about it till I started doing research versus sites like Pompeii. I love Pompeii. I took a whole course on Pompeii um, in college, but it was little surprises in my research like that one that make me smile and giggle. <laughs> so um, how much research uh, conservatively did you put into making this book? A hefty amount, as you would be able to see by the bibliography in the back of the book. <laughs> um, yeah, there are this book went through a lot of iterations as well. So we originally had a focus on the sites versus 
the narrative that it ended up being, which is discussing pieces of archaeological process and scattering the sites in between as examples of those things that we're talking about, those bigger topics. Originally, it was just going to focus on certain sites. And so I had a bunch of other ones that I was going to use. So I ended up, but they didn't find a good place in the second iteration that ended up being the final version. So I ended up doing research for about five to 10 sites that just didn't end up in the book. So I now know about those and the cool things about those sites, but unfortunately I can't share those in the book because it would have been too much. So um, let's see here. How, um, how did you decide that you wanted to do a children's book? Uh, so the, the publishing company that this is published under called Persnickety Press, which is an imprint of Wonder Mill Books, is a children's publication. Um, so they only publish children's books. And so that was one reason, but also I, the way I talk and the way I express myself and my love for archaeology, I think is more kid-friendly versus like astute college professor-like, like writing one of those um, papers or more adult books, I felt my writing style and my way of expressing myself was more geared to children and inspiring those children. As I was discussing earlier, um, I didn't discover archaeology until a lot later in my life, and I want to inspire and get kids involved a lot earlier. I'm very, very passionate about that, and I'm hoping that also, this could be a resource in libraries and in the classroom, and kids will get excited about the visuals of being able to scan QR codes, which you normally don't really get to do with a book, um, as becoming really engaging. And I just want them to have like a really fun time reading this book versus like, oh, this is homework, you know. Um, but teachers, we want there it to is be homework without them thinking that it's homework. Yeah, that was always the best homework, uh, I thought, in, like, um, grade school. But, yeah, like, educators, there's an education guide on the Persnickety Press website. Um, and so it it's official, handcrafted to for the educators to use this book in the classroom or outside of the classroom as a tool. So it, it, it gives them different ideas on and how it connects to different, like, STEM um, and other curriculum, curricula, curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Either one. <laughs> so it sounds like you've done a lot of research. Um, I'm going to wrap things up um, for yeah. people who want to learn more to working with children in archaeology or just archaeology in general. What uh, what advice would you give people? I would say um we only have so much time in the day, but just try to set aside a certain amount of time per day or per week that you can just sit down and tinker away at your computer, look up recent articles on archaeological discoveries, or um, pull up a list of coolest archaeological sites and then do like more in-depth research on ones that you find that look interesting on certain days. Just don't be afraid to get out there and learn and get your hands a little dirty, even if you're not in the field, but even just in the internet, because sometimes it's hard to get out to a physical field and learn hands-on and get that experience because that is a lot of time sometimes for some people. So just don't be afraid to get your hands dirty just by researching online. Yeah. And that being said, make sure you are double checking your sources that it is from an yeah. accredited journal university institution that is accredited by some sort of governing body and not just some Yahoo sitting in his basement. Yeah, that's where you get the kind of thing like aliens built the pyramids and stuff like that. I can't stand it. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not something that I subscribe to on this program. And those of you who want to argue with me about that, that's what the comment section is for. Please be gentle <laughs> with your comments though. 
I'll, I'll be down there in the comments too if anybody has any questions or anything well caitlin thank you so much for joining us today and uh could you show the book one more time yeah the book is dig it archaeology for kids if you search up my name caitlin socken s-o-c-k-i-n with the title on amazon barnes and noble online um persnickety press um our publishing company any of those things you can find the book and order it now so so it, it, any, it is any, it is available it, now it actually is on amazon you can buy it as of right now and then um the official release date is the 25th where you can buy it anywhere um online not anywhere anywhere <laughs> yeah you can't just go out and buy books sadly not everywhere sells books even though it would be great if they did yeah they're they don't exactly grow on trees that would be fun though okay a book tree is now something i want that sounds amazing <laughs> yes <laughs> just pull an illy out of the out of your oak oh what if it was a tree that the books change like you take the book you finish it put it back in the tree and then the tree gives you another book <laughs> uh, the, fu the future is bright i like this idea um, you should expand on this in a future episode for sure. Yeah, I absolutely will. I'm going to write that down and look into that. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks, everybody, for joining in today. And stay tuned for more. Thank you so much.